Welcome to Live Press's continuing training webinar, Live Press Summer Grab Bag, promote your new books and SRC events. Today, we're going to cover a few things. We'll start with Sitka. Jennifer will show you some ways you can bring Live Press and Sitka's Evergreen together to promote your new books or other special collections. We'll look at Live Press and specifically options in the events calendar that can help you get ready for summer reading club events and more. Over to Jennifer. All right, and I am just going to stop the slideshow here. There we go. And take us over to the Evergreen uh, staff client. We're on the Maple, or we're on the training server logged in as Maple. Um, so if your library uses both LibPress and Sitka's Evergreen, um, you can use them together. And um, we're gonna talk about two different ways you can promote not just your new books, but any collection of items that you wanna highlight. Um, we're going to start with carousels and then we're going to move on to lists. So as you may have seen, we just rolled out the new carousels in the last month. Um, so Evergreen now has a feature which enables library staff to create a variety of carousels. Currently, this feature is only available to use with LibPress sites. Um, the carousels that you create in Evergreen are not going to display on your public catalog. This replaces the old Sitka carousels, which are no longer going to function as of August 1st. So if you haven't already, do submit a ticket to co-op support asking for carousel permissions. Um, and please include the barcodes for any staff who need that uh, those permissions. Once you have permissions, in Evergreen, you're going to go to Administration, Local Administration, and Carousels. And I'm just going to zoom my screen in a bit here to make that bigger. So here you can see the carousels that I have already created. Now, uh, when you do come to the when you do log in and come to the carousels page, do make sure that you're logged in with one of those accounts that has carousel permissions um, or you aren't going to be able to do anything here. So there are five different types of carousels that you can create and they're outlined in the documentation. And all of the documentation on how to create the carousels in Evergreen and use them on your LibPress site is in the LibPress manual. It's not in the Sitka manual, so uh, make sure you look for it in the LibPress site here. So the five types of carousels are newly cataloged items, which is based on the active date and the shelving location for the uh, title's copies, newest item by shelving location, based on the active date of the title's copies and organized by shelving location, recently returned items, so based on uh, the most recently circulated items check-in dates, and top circulated titles, so based on the most circulated copies um, in, your, uh, in your library. There's also a carousel where you can um, choose your own, so you can do a completely manual one. So I'm gonna take us back over to the carousel's administration. And we're gonna start by setting up a carousel for newly cataloged items. So I'm gonna click new carousels. The owner is gonna be Maple. I'm gonna give it a name. I'm gonna do juvenile, oops. Juvenile fiction, newly cataloged. Oops, and I'm gonna spell cataloged correctly. And for my carousel type, I'm gonna choose newly cataloged items. I'm not gonna put an age limit because I want, I'm looking for newly cataloged things so they they shouldn't be old at this point. Um, and I'm gonna tell it that I want a maximum of 25 items to show up on that car carousel. Um, we are recommending that 25 is the maximum uh, that you use. For my item library, I'm gonna choose Maple again and click add to add that. Um, now, if you are a uh, multi-branch library, you may wish to add multiple branches um, as item libraries. And don't forget your system itself doesn't actually own any items. So you don't need to add your system or unit, you just need to add the actual branches and whichever branches you want included in your carousel. And now we need to add a shelving location to tell it which newly cataloged items to look at. So in this case, I'm gonna do juvenile fiction and add that shelving location. 
And again, if you're a multi-branch library, you may want to change the scope. So you may want to change the scope here to your system and then tell it to include descendants. If you want to create a carousel that includes um, items from multiple branches, um, because you will need to be able to see the shelving locations from all of your branches. Um, so keep that in mind if you're multi-branch. And then at the bottom here, we need to say is active so that our carousel uh, will actually do anything. And then I'm going to hit save here. And it's created my new carousel. Shows me what type of carousel, the name, and the last refresh time. So you can see we have several carousels here that uh, were refreshed today. Um, that will happen automatically overnight, but also I can click on the line and uh, right click and refresh selected. So I can force it to do a refresh. Um, as that little pop-up said, it will take a couple minutes to do that refresh. Um, so we will uh, give it that moment. Now, I'm just gonna hit refresh and see on the browser and see if it's, yep. So we can see now we have a re last refresh time of today. So I've now created my carousel um, in uh, Evergreen. Um, I'm gonna set up one more carousel here. So we're also gonna do a manual carousel. So if I go to new carousels again, very similar going to put in my owner, give it a name. Choose my carousel type. This time I'm going to choose manual. Um, again, I'm going to tell it maximum of 25 items. You're actually going to be able to pick exactly what goes into this carousel, um, but the maximum items is a required field. So you do have to put a number in that, um, even if you are picking exactly how many items are going to go onto that carousel. And then again, oops, we're going to put uh, Maple Public Library as our item library. In this case, we're not going to choose a shelving location because Evergreen doesn't need to know what shelving location to automatically generate things um, because it's not going to do anything automatic for us here. And again, I will choose this one to be active. And then I will click Save. Now for this one, I wanna take a look here at the, sy the system generated bucket. So if I click on this, it's gonna open up a record bucket in another tab. Now, what I need to do is I need to take a look at what this bucket number is. So for this bucket, it's bucket number 27. And knowing that, I can now go and I can add records to this bucket for items that I want displaying in my carousel in any way that you would add um, to a record bucket. So there's a few different ways that I can do that. So if I do a catalog search, and I can uh, go into this record here, from the other actions, I have an add to carousel option. So I can click on that. And any carousels uh, that are manual, that are active, will show in this list. So I can add this to the Summer Reading Club one from here. So add that to the carousel. If I go back to my results list and find another here. Um, if I want to add uh, this one, I can also uh, check it to add it to my basket, add multiple. Uh, items from my search results, come up to the basket items, add basket to bucket, and go to the shared bucket. And because I wrote down the bucket ID number 27, I then add it to that shared bucket. It'll confirm the name, and I'll just confirm that. You can also add to a record bucket through item status, um, and as well, uh, where we saw that you could add it to a carousel, you can also add it directly to that bucket there. So quite a few ways that you can add to your record bucket. And if I go back to the record buckets here, I'm just going to refresh my screen. And you can see that I now have two items in my record bucket. And so those two are now, or sorry, two records in my record bucket. 
And those are now going to display as part of my carousel. Uh, so I now have um, multiple carousels uh, that I can use with my LibPress site. So now that I have my carousels set up, it's a good idea to take a look at the carousel ID. Um, just know which carousels you're wanting to put onto your LibPress site. And then we're gonna come over to our LibPress site here, go into highlights and go into new items because we wanna put this into our new items. We can see we already have one carousel. We've got the overdrive carousel currently. Um, and if we, oh, sorry, I gotta move zoom out of the way here. Um, if we go to our website, we can see we've got that carousel um, but that's the only thing in our new items highlight right now. So if we want to add uh, a carousel from Sitka, there's instructions on the side here. Um, part of these instructions are still from the old method. The important stuff is in the bottom here because not only is it telling you how to add the carousel, um, it's also showing you a list of all of the active carousels for your library, as well as their ID. Um, so it actually pulls that information uh, from Evergreen for you. So if I want to add a carousel, I'm going to give my carousel a name. And then I'm going to follow the instruction uh, to form the short code. So bracket, carousel, oh, no, uh, sorry, Sitka, Sitka underscore carousel space, carousel underscore ID equals, and then in quotes, the number for my carousel. And in this case, I want carousel five to display. Uh, so I'm gonna do my closed brackets and then I'm going to update that. And then if I come over back to viewing the actual site and refresh, you can see I now have my frogs carousel displaying. Um, and I can go through, I can add additional carousels. So if I also wanted um, our new juvenile fiction, And I'm just going to copy paste that so I don't have to type the whole thing out again. And that was ID 14. So we'll update again. And then refresh. And you can see that we don't actually have anything showing yet. Um, and this is because Evergreen is still refreshing. So you may find um, that uh, right away when you create it, you might need to do an extra refresh um, if you've created a brand new uh, carousel. Um, so you can see we now have that new juvenile fiction uh, displaying. And so our patrons can page through our different carousels. Um, the one, the frogs here one, which I created manually, and then the new juvenile fiction one that Evergreen is pulling based on uh, newly cataloged juvenile fiction uh, items. Now, um, the manual carousels can be especially handy if you wanna showcase a particular set of items because you can pick exactly what displays. There's also a report template coming, just a couple more tweaks to make sure it's working as expected. And that report is going to allow you to report on the, circ uh, the circulation within timeframe uh, for items in a particular bucket. Uh, so you'll be able to say, okay, I put up this carousel at the beginning of May, what kind of circulation have we had on the items in the carousel for the month of May, or maybe the month of May and June. Um, so potentially handy to see um, how much use the items that you're just uh, highlighting are getting. Uh, so before we move on to lists, are there any questions? And uh, I can also answer questions at the end.
Okay, so we're going to uh, continue on to lists because in addition to carousels, you can create and share lists of items with your users. And these lists can be created in a few ways. I'm going to start off with the way that we recommend. So you can use the My List function in my account. And a great example of how this can be used um, is how Gibson and District Public Library has done. Um, you can see they have both staff picks and bestsellers lists. So if we go into one of these lists, um, you can see we've come back into the catalog to actually see this list. Um, and they also have um, uh, a what's new section uh, using those lists as well. So if we come back over to Maple, um, and go into my account. What we recommend is that you create a patron account that your library can use for lists. This should be a generic account that doesn't get used for any borrowing um, so that any staff member who needs to create lists can use it. Um, you just set it up as a PL adult account. So there's no uh, access to the staff client with it. Um, so you can share that username and password with the different staff members that need to be able to create lists. Um, this also means that if you have a staff member who leaves the library, um, you don't lose access to all of your lists. So I've set up uh, one for Maple. So I'm just going to log in with that one. And the training server apparently is just going to think about this for a moment. There we go. So I'm going to go into my lists here. And you can see I've got one list so far for Beach Reads. I can create a new list. So I'm just going to click Create New List, give it a name. And you can give it a description. And that description will show at the top when somebody looks at your list. I want to set this list to be shared because that's how it's possible for your patrons to see it. And I'm going to do create list. <clears throat> so now I've got my summer reading club list. And if I do a search in the catalog, I can now add both um, physical and e-resources to my list. Um, so if I wanna add this one, I'm just gonna add it to my list and I'm gonna add it to the Summer Reading Club one. Now, any of you who've worked with the list before know that adding them through the um, public catalog can take a bit of time. Um, and you know set, uh, there are some advantages though to setting up these curated lists. And a lot of that is that you can control exactly what goes in the list and then you can edit it as needed. Now, one really handy thing, because as I said, you know, it can be slow to add them through the public catalog here, is if we go to my lists and we go to the viewing catalog, and I'm gonna do this for my uh, Beach Reads list, So first of all, the URL at the top, this is what you're going to post anywhere that you want this list to be uh, usable. But the book bag ID in here, which is uh, important here, so this book bag has an ID of 24. What a list is underneath is a record bucket. So if we come back into the staff client, um, and we're actually already in the record buckets here, if I go to shared bucket, I can say I want bucket 24 and there's my list. So I can now add and remove records in this record bucket. And what I do is reflected in the list that shows through the public catalog. Now it's important to know you can't create a bucket and turn it into a my list. So you always have to start in the public catalog 
um, and then come back into the catalog. But if you are wanting to add new books to your catalog or to your list, it may be really handy to be able to create, you know, your July list in the public catalog, but then actually add the records as you're cataloging in the staff client. Um, so a very potential handy thing. And also because they are record buckets underneath, you can use the report template that uh, is coming to run statistics on items uh, that are included in the list. Now, in addition to the curated lists, uh, if we go back over to the staff or the public catalog, um, if we go back to, uh, actually, we're going to go into advanced search here. If you do a search here in your catalog, and the training server is just going to take a moment to think about that. It's not a very pretty URL, but you can use this URL. So you can post this somewhere and it's a it's the results of gardening if somebody goes to look at it. Um, also, if we go back to advanced search, you can do a search based just on shelving location. So if I choose juvenile holiday here and then submit, this is going to give me a list of everything which apparently is nothing in my juvenile holiday uh, collection. Um, you do have to have items in that collection. Oh, you know what? Because my search term gardening is still there. So uh, let's clear that because I don't have any gardening books in juvenile holiday. So let's do that again with juvenile holiday and submit. And so here I have all of my juvenile holiday books. And again, I can use that URL to share those out. Um, one important thing if you are doing searches using that shelving location is it only works for your smaller shelving locations. Um, for shelving locations that have thousands of items in them, the search will time out before you get any results um, because Evergreen won't return all 20, 30,000 uh, items that you have in your adult fiction section, for example. Um, but for smaller uh, collections, it can be very handy. Now, the other thing that uh, some people uh, have done in the past and, and still continue to do is that you can also curate a list by including a 590 field in your mark record. And then under advanced search, you would go to expert search, do a search specifically for that 590 field with the subfield and the value that you've put into it. Um, and then you get search results and you can post those somewhere. Um, this does work, um, but uh, we would definitely recommend using the my list functionality over this now. Um, especially since, um, as I mentioned, as you're creating lists uh, and cataloging new items, because you can manipulate the list through the buckets, um, it's very handy in the staff client there. And one of the great things is that because all of these lists are using the Evergreen public catalog, when your patron goes to a link, your availability information is up to date. So if we come back to my list here, and I'm just gonna go into the Summer Reading Club one, view that in the catalog so you can see how the description displays. So you can see I've got both the title and the description displaying, and it's showing me the current um, availability information for this item. Um, and my patron can go find it or they can place a hold or add it to their own list. Um, so anything that they could do in the public catalog, they can now do uh, with the items on your list. Uh, any questions before I pass it over to Christine? And again, um, I'm also happy to answer questions at the end. Got 
All right, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, Christine, so that you can start. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for being our special guest today. Um, that was all very detailed. So I'm pretty sure everybody is glad that we have this recorded so it can be reviewed. Um, this next part is going to be a bit more um, uh, of a bit of just promoting ideas rather than a descriptive type of um, display. Let's see, sorry, just getting that shared. Okay, so the second part of the summer grab bag is more of a, of a review about what you can do with Live Press um, and how the events can be optimized using the series page. And because this is a relatively new feature in the events calendar, I just wanted to go over it quickly because I think that there are some things that you could do with this that would really be good for the summer reading, summer reading club. So right now, we're at the front page of the Maple Public Library and we're just scrolling through the slides and you may notice um, that we have this Summer Reading Club slide that I just created from the bookmarks. Uh, now this is specific to the BC Summer Reading Club. So for our members in Manitoba, uh, they have a different theme, um, but if you wanted to send me any slides, I can also have those shared for your libraries. Um, all of the processes that I'm gonna be discussing will obviously be the same for promoting your individual summer reading clubs. So from here, I'm going to just link through to what looks like a page. This is not just a page. This is a special page. This is a series page. Um, so what you can see up at the top, like if you go right here, this is the URL and you can see it looks a little bit different than a page would. It says summer, so series slash summer reading club 2023. So that matches what we have here. And if you scroll down, you'll see that I took a bunch of promo material from the summer reading club website, um, but I haven't formatted it yet. So it doesn't look the way that you might expect. And I've done that on purpose because we're gonna talk about that in a second. Um, You'll notice that uh, there is a video here that was done in ASL and that was produced by the sponsors of the Summer Reading Club in BC. So given that BC is going accessible and we're talking a lot about accessible BC, I'm going to be talking a little bit about accessible markup on your page. Um, some of you have, have met with me individually this might be a review, but it's probably always good to talk about. So I'll talk about that when we get to the administration view. Um, when you scroll down here, you're going to see that there's going to be here all of the events that are attached to your summer reading club. And these are going to show up here. I'm going to show you how to attach this on one page. So this is what makes this page so interesting is not only are you going to have all the events for something called summer reading club but also any other individual events that you might create you can attach that to this series and they'll all uh, show up on this page this will become more clear as i keep talking um what else did I want to say about this? Oh, right. Because of this URL, because it's so specific, this is going to be what's going to allow you to do a lot of your promotion. So across your social media, this is just going to be a quick URL that you can send to people and all of your information can be encapsulated on your events page um, or this series events page, um, which can be really handy. Um, okay, so now let's go into the um, into the the administration view of the page. So you'll see that it's set up fairly fairly straightforwardly like what you see when you're editing pages or events and but some of the options are a little bit different so we're going to go through that what i like to do if i'm working a lot with the um the back end is really situate yourself and make sure you know where you are in your editing process so i usually go right up to the top and just go yes i am editing the series the series is different from an events and it's different from a web page um, so it's either going to say edit page or edit events or edit series it's usually just i like to go through all of the separate areas on this view to make sure that i haven't forgotten anything and i don't accidentally start changing my content depending on what kind of a page event 
um, or series that I'm on. So you'll see again that the text is here, unformatted. Here's the embedded YouTube video. All of this is in the live press manual, by the way. Oh, I should say right now, if you have any questions, if you want to just unmute and shout out to me, go right ahead. Otherwise, I will be answering a lot more questions at the end. Um, so you can see that you've got your editing of the description page right here. Um, right here is where you would add events to the series. And this lists all the series, uh, all the events that are already added to the series. So this will be important um, when you start creating um, your robust programming for the Summer Reading Club over the next couple of months. Um, so again, the publish is here, you have your author here, series options, this, you'll probably want to check this, um, you'll see how that works out in just a moment. Um, what I want to do right now, though, is very quickly go over the formatting for a page. One thing that you might notice is that this may not be, this is very clear, this is called your slug. Um, this can be edited. So I can click on here and I can make this even shorter, which might be useful. So SRC 2023, that's very clear, very short, just makes it more specific. If I were to hit okay though, I'm gonna have to go back and change <laughs> that, that slide that I had and make sure that that gets changed as well. Remember from the front page, I had the, in the slide manager that link from the slide. So I'd have to go and change that. So just know that if you change this, all of your links across your website will have to be changed as well. So this is something that you would wanna do right away when you set up your series, or just know that you have to go back and change it. I'm just gonna cancel it for the moment. I just wanted to point this out because this can be done across your pages and your events as well. Um, and sometimes that can just make the URL a little bit more precise and sometimes you do want that. Now, we're going to be talking a lot more over the next um, couple of months about accessibility. I am going to be doing a presentation later on this year, but I just wanted to go over some of the top hits of accessibility principles with this page. So one thing is headers. Headers are really useful for your page for organizing your information. And I'm just gonna quickly go over it. Know that every time there's a title on any events, page or series, anything that's up in this area, this is called a heading one. This is going to apply the formatting heading one to that. It's going to be in larger type usually, um, sometimes in bold. It depends on how it's set up on your particular website. But this is always going to be a heading one. With headings, it's not just about about the format, how it looks on the page. It's also about applying a style and a markup to, uh, it applies code in the back end to allow screen readers and other accessibility tools to really know how to navigate this page. So a heading one is always the first thing that you start with. The accessibility tools will know that that is the most important information. That's where they're going to start. They're going to look for that heading one information right up here. So the next thing that you would use on your page would be a heading two. No, don't go to a heading three. Don't mistake that th the way things look is how you're styling your page. You want to style your page so that it actually marks it up in a very distinct way so that the accessibility tools in other types of coding and the way that the web works um, is going to look for the next header in the sequence. So you always want to nest the headers. So the next header that we want to do is a heading two. That's probably going to be this one. The way that I like to set up my page is a title, a tiny little bit of a, um, like one sentence up at the top, just as a summary. So if somebody's using a screen reader, they will know right away that they're on the right page. So this one here is going to be a heading two. I'm going to apply heading two this way. Um, and then uh, all of the rest of the information under this heading two is going to be related to this title. So the way that Google crawlers work um, as well is anything that's in a header is going to be really um, those keywords that are going to help people to navigate your site. And also for 
understanding and scanning the page, you want to make these headers to be as specific as possible. So journey through time, that may not be the best heading to, but at the moment, let's say that it is. Maybe we've already got Summer Reading Club as the heading one. So maybe Journey Through Time as a heading two is going to be the next obvious thing. So we're going to leave that right now. This next one, Things to Know, it's pretty clear, um, I think. And that's going to be a heading three. I'm also going to take out this colon because it's not really necessary in a header. So things to know, if somebody is scrolling through your page, this makes sense. Things to know, this is going to be the next thing that they're going to look for, for information about the program. Um, and maybe this next one here, how things works, that's probably not useful and it doesn't really add anything and I'm gonna take that out. Set your reading goals, uh, that's the next thing for things to know, participate in the library's events. Uh, remember, see below for all events. We're on the series page. Everything's going to be underneath. This all makes sense. Let's make this a list. And I'm going to do the toolbar to toolbar toggle to open up more options. And oh, I didn't need to, but that's good to know. And I'm going to hit the bulleted list. Great. Things are starting to look pretty clear. Now, this could be Another heading three, because this heading three relates to journey through time. So things to know and parents are kind of on equal footing um, in terms of uh, importance. So parents, is that the best heading? Maybe it is. Maybe if we put for more information, that might be better. So now I'm going to apply a heading three. Okay, this is starting to look really good. I'm going to make this consistent as a list. And here we go. I like it. Okay, so I've decided that I'm going to stay with this slug. Everything is appropriately done. Oh, next thing I need to look at are links. Now, links are really important after headers as well in terms of accessibility. This is a very clear link that's going up to the BC Summer Reading Club um, the website, but it's not necessarily clear that it's an external link. So there's a couple of different ways to handle that to allow the user of your page to know where you're going to go um, if you click on that link. BC Summer Reading Club may not be so clear that you're going to an external link. I might want to do external link here, um, or I might want to rewrite the sentence to make it clear that this link is actually going to a, a separate page. And that's probably the better way to do it. For the moment though, I'm just going to do that. Now, another thing is you don't want to just kick people out of your website and then not allow them to go back. So currently, I think this web, this link is set up so that the whole page would just then go to the BC SRC page. Let's edit this link. And we're gonna go to the gear and I'm going to choose open link in a new tab and then update. That means for, for the external links, some, like a new tab would open up here, but they can always go back to your website. And that's the way that you want to handle different links. So I think down here, this is again, another link. It goes directly to the about page. Again, I might want to help the user um, figure out where they're going to go by rewriting the sentence or putting external link. I am going to edit this. Yep, open link in a new tab. One more thing I want to say about links. Don't write, find out more about the Summer Reading Club here. Click here to find out more about the Summer Reading Club and then make that the link. If somebody's using assist assistive technology, they need to know where that link is going. And again, it may not be clear in the context of the sentence where it's going to go. Um, you want to help them to know where they're going to go. Um, or even just for regular users, you just don't want to, su to surprise them. So for anybody who is, um, who is navigating your website, no matter how they're navigating it, it is going to be useful for them to make sure that they know what is going to happen when they click on that link. So you want to make sure that your headers and your links all have descriptive language within them. Okay, so this is starting to look pretty good. I'm pretty happy with this. I don't wanna lose it. I'm just gonna update it right now. Okay, and down at the bottom, 
I'm going to start adding events to the series and I am going to search and I have this, this tea party event. That's not what we want to add here. This is actually something that I set up for the friends of the library, but this journey through time craft time, that's a one event that I created up. It's one time only, and I'm going to add it here. And then we're going to update it. And you can see now that this one has been added to the series page. Now we're just going to look at it, look at the front view of it. Things are starting to format. It looks pretty clear, lots of white space. It's easy to navigate. And right down here, you see that the event is has been added really simply. So perfect. However, I also have a set of events that's actually a series of ongoing events. So let's go and take a look at that right now. We're going to go into the back end. We're going to go to our events. And down here on this page, you can see Journey Through Time Story Time. And I've set this up as a recurring event. You can tell it's a series here because of this little indicator. And right now the series, when I created this series, it automatically applies a name called Journey Through Time Story Time because they're assuming that that's going to be our series name. And that's good. And that's also why it didn't show up when I, when I said, um, when I was looking for events on the series page for add series, because it already had a series. So it wasn't going to allow me to add it over here, but we can go into this event. So here, edit event, um, you can see there's this long URL um, you can change this, but if it's in a series, you might not want to mess with that too much because you're going to take it out of the recurring event. You can see I've uh, set it up for weekly. Um, and I filled out all this information. And right over here, I have put the series information right up at the top. And I can edit this. So one thing is when you're going to do your edit events on your page, this may not look the same. And the way that you can change it, you can move these around. And I've optimized the way that my events page has been set up because I wanted to make sure that everything was really easy for me to just go through, go, yep, yeah, edit event. Here's my header one title. This is my description area that I'm going to enter, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, I need to add a featured image. So I put that up here. I put the series here and the events categories. So this is where I want to show you a few other things that you can do if you're not aware of it. So obviously I need to put um, details here. And obviously it would be much more um, descriptive, but for the sake of this demo, this is what I'm going to write. Now over here, I'm gonna add my featured image. So I'm gonna set the featured image. And these are all the ones that I have available to me. Um, and I can upload one straight from here. I'm just going to add this one right now. And I'm gonna set this as my featured image because it's a square, it's going to look really good across all of the events calendar uh, features on the website. Um, so this is great, I set up my featured image. If you're not clear about what the difference is between a featured image and an image that you put into your individual events, uh, this is all explained in the Live Press manual. But I just wanted to point out for those of you who aren't using featured images that it can be really, really useful. Um, and we'll, we'll wrap up this whole discussion with why. Now down here is series. And right now it's in this journey through time story time, but I want to add it to that summer reading club series page. So here we go. I'm going to just change the series right now. So this is just going to automatically update that series page. Now, this is where if you don't use event categories, you might want to. So I'm going to add a new event category right here called Summer Reading Club. And I could also just do SRC and think, do I do this? Yeah. OK, so you can see now this all of these events in the series are going to be added to the Summer Reading Club. And I'm going to update this. All events. Yes. 
Excellent. So you can see up here that the whole series of events of 63 total, because I set it to the end of the summer, that's a lot. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what I did there to make 63 events, but let's just assume that that's correct. Um, oh, because I went to 2024. Okay. See, this is useful. You, <laughs> I messed up my date and times here, maybe. Um, anyways, good note that if you look at everything on the page, you're going to catch mistakes like that, and it's going to make it really obvious for you. In any case, now let's go back to the uh, front page. We're going to just check town here for upcoming events. And you can see, this is why the featured image is so fun because it just kind of pops them in here um, into this list if you're using this kind of list. Now let's view the calendar. Here are all the events and here is a uh, journey through time, story time with the featured events. And this is great, but, oh, here we go. Summer Reading Club, here's the series page. Now let's check to see what's happened down here. So it gives an abbreviated uh, version down here. Um, so you can see that not only can you add recurring events there, but you can add those individual events and individual events. You can also add the registration if that's something that you have opted in for one of our live press add-on services. It is a nominal fee annually of $100, but a lot of our library members have been really using it successfully. So I just wanted to show you how it looks on the page. Um, it has this great box. I have set, set it up so that um, you can fill out um, different things like allergies. Uh, so this is all useful information if you are doing summer reading club with a number of children where you might need to gather their um, other information such as uh, who their guardians are and how to contact them and just anything else you may need to know. This can be a really useful feature right away at the uh, registration level. One other thing I wanted to show you is if we go back to events, if we, oh, sorry, I didn't wanna do that. If we go to the Friends of the Library one that I had set up, you can see that a number of different libraries have started to create things like a wait list and it's really easy to do. So this, you would normally create a wait list, which is just another area um, or sorry, another form that you would add once your capacity is filled. So you can see here, that I have two remaining tickets. So I had capped our guests for the friends of the library at 13, there's two remaining. Once this was full, this would be closed and it would say full. And then I would add a second series of um, registration tickets. Um, or RSVPs, and I would call it a wait list. And this can, this is all described in the live press manual, and it can also be really handy. So this is just something I wanted to point out as ideas for you. Now let's go back again to the front page. And I just wanted to, what else was it that I wanted to show you? Um, oh yeah. Okay. So one last thing. So right up here under uh, events in the main menu, these are different categories. So I'm going to show you right now how you can add that summer reading club category to this main menu right now. What you would do is you would go to customize and you would go to menus. You would go to your main menu, scroll down and you can see that the library events calendar is here and we wanna add some reading calendar right there. We're going to add that item. We are going to scroll down here to event categories. And here we go, summer reading club. I'm gonna add that. Now I just have to drag this up. Where, oops. Okay, let's put it there. Publish. And there you go. Summer Reading Club is now a link right on your library events, or sorry, on the main menu under library events calendar. 
Now, the one thing is, I bet that craft time that I created, that standalone event, that probably needs to have the summer reading club category applied to it. But otherwise, I think we're really getting there. And I hope that you got lots of ideas from this little demo. And I think we're going to stop here. We're going to stop the recording. Um, and we are going to open up other questions.